Okay. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I hope that if you're joining us from the Eastern States in Australia, that you and your loved ones are safe and well, given the current circumstances. Uh, but for today, we'll be looking uh, at a 101 on water quality sampling on mine sites and go through uh, some of the key learnings that we've experienced uh, and we'd like to share with you. Um, so thanks for uh, your time in joining us today. Um, if this isn't your first uh, HydroChair webinar, you may notice uh, that I'm joined by a familiar face, uh, Michelle Canton, who is our Senior Monitoring Consultant based in Queensland. Uh, Michelle is a hydrogeologist and has extensive field experience conducting a multiple uh, hydrogeological and environmental projects and is extremely confident with environmental field sampling on mine sites, uh, particularly with the ongoing continuous works that we conduct up in uh, Queensland. So thanks for joining me to talk about your experiences and learnings today, Michelle. Uh, and for those who don't know, my name is Kyle McLaren. I'm an environmental scientist and the technical sales manager at HydroTerra. Uh, I work very closely with uh, mines on equipment and technology selection and field data collection practices through uh, my experiences on mine site monitoring and sampling. Uh, and also in the background, joined by Marcio, who will be uh, facilitating proceedings. So thanks, Marcio, for making sure uh, all hopefully goes, goes well. So as you might be familiar with, uh, we always enjoy at the end answering any questions you may have through this presentation. So feel free to write in the Q&A box a uh, question and we'll go through them at the end. If I could ask if you could um, please just write your questions in the actual Q&A uh, box and not the chat also, that'll just help me uh, consolidate everything and allow us to make sure we cover them all. Um, so uh, it's great to see that we always get some uh, good interest on our field sampling when we're out and about here. Um, but always we, we look to generate awareness and uh, share our knowledge to ensure our, our clients are up to date with the latest in technology and methodology. Um, we facilitate training to allow the appropriate adoption of these technologies and, and get a real understanding of your industry needs uh, to promote you know, communication and ensure that we're uh, meeting your monitoring needs in the future. So for today, uh, Michelle will take the reins and, and talk us through uh, the main considerations when sampling at mine sites, both during and prior to conducting uh, some field data collection approaches uh, and a lot of learnings from the field, which we'd like to share uh, with you all uh, today. So I'd like to now hand it over to Michelle to talk about these points. Um, so thanks very much, Michelle. Thank you, Kaya. Thank you, Marcio. Thank you, everyone, for coming in and joining us today. So I would like uh, to share a bit of my experience, as Kaya said, and um, a bit of what I talk about when I train uh, our hydrotera field technicians as well. OK, so um, these are the least of the considerations. Let's start with health and safety. Uh, inductions for specific areas. Just really ensure that you've got inductions for everything or where the bores are located, because sometimes if you cross the road, it's not um, the same area and you need to do a new induction. Okay, sometimes we, we need to do like five or six inductions to cover all monitoring points. Another thing that I always try to keep in mind uh, are sparks risks that uh, will define the equipment that we are going to use on the field, okay? Um, and a chat with the client, what is the concern, the contaminant or the indicator, and how these will be managed on site. So if there is something on site that can indicate that that location is a higher potential of contaminant or not. As an example, I can show you on the right side, some readings for, from a bore, um, you can see the pH is really, really high conductivity. It's like if all readings are really uh, different from uh, um, a bore that we sample every day. Okay, so the color of this water was brown, dark brown. And I got an incident there in this bore, specifically this bore in 2017, when the 
handle of the bucket was loose and a drop of water got in my boots. And what happened, this cask water got through my boots and burned my, the top of my, my feet. But there was two hours later, I was back to work. So be aware and inductions are really, really important. So you know what to do uh, in this case or in the case that you get any risk, okay? Uh, critical areas, access. So if you are not confident with uh, how to drive on site or with um, big uh, machineries around you, just ask for a squad. They will be more than happy to provide you and to keep you safe, okay? Roads, um, on the roads, they always ask us to use the back roads as the, the monitoring points usually, they are around um, the, the mining sites, dams and etc. And be aware also activity on site. The activity on site, usually when you do um, field works, just be in mind that you are going to need to work on Saturday and Sunday where the activity on site is less. And there are some critical points that you need, you will be only able to assess on Saturday or Sunday. Just chat with your client and align these prior you go on site, okay? And also, um, the area that you are going to sample, if there is any potential of risk or there was any leaks or anything that changed the last time you spoke with the client. So you be aware and that you need to be more careful on those areas. Okay, um, priority boards, always the client um, wants to know, um, not always, but Sometimes they, they want you to sample one ball before others um, just to get results uh, quicker. But also what is important to consider is if you know that that area or that monitoring point is a high in contamination, okay? It's really, really high level. Just leave that one for last. So even if it happens to cross contaminate, you don't, don't cross contaminate during the day. So start with the less um, less risk ball to the most risk ball. Okay. Uh, look for the specific requirements for the program, including states regulations. For example, quality assurance and quality control. The frequency of duplicates, triplicates, if they are required. Field blanks, if it's daily, once per round or what they would like to. Um, trip blanks and also ring sets, what they are required, okay? Trigger limits, sometimes uh, you'll be asked while sampling or uh, recording the readings to check on the trigger limits, the higher or lowest. And if this reaches the highest or is above or, or lower, you need to take some actions. For example, um, calibrate your water quality meter again or recheck everything to make sure that that limit is it's above or below the trigger limit, okay? Equipment calibration. It's a bit trickier, but I will show you why. It's uh, state regulations, they change. Kayo, can you please next slide? Thank you. So in two examples that I bought here today, it's in Victoria, they say that you need to calibrate your equipment according to the supplier. So what they say you should be doing and um, that you should use fresh solutions every time that you calibrate and keep an eye on pH and DO uh, meters to, ca to calibrate every in every use. However, if we look at Queensland, next slide, please. They say that you need to calibrate before each field trip and after the each, each field trip. So beginning of the day and end of the day. Okay, it's how we understand this. And the standards or the solutions you calibrate can be reused. So just be aware of um, where you are, doing some sampling, how you are calibrating your equipment 
and keep these uh, on hand or in your mind, the difference between them. Okay, next please. Now uh, let's talk a bit about how, how to choose the methodology and equipment, which one you're going to, to use for each case. Next please. So always try forcing, stick with the program requirements, but also you need to check the board condition, uh, the structure, I mean, and the recharge, but you need to prioritize a few things as well that you're going to learn about it. Next. So what is the objective of when you are on site? It should follow the program and guidelines as much as possible with minimal water disturbance and considering the purging time with a focus on collecting the sample and completing the round. So what I mean about it, that many of the time uh, you cannot follow the guideline step by step. You need to be a little bit flexible and creative to get the sample as well. So water disturbance, what I mean about it, it's how um, you, you mix the water down, down the well or when you are going to do some sampling. So in my view, uh, we have the low flow method. Um, it's the standard or, or what you should be using all the time when possible with an external peristaltic pump, peristaltic pump or a dedicated pneumatic pump, okay? Where you don't move much the water, you don't have a lot of influence in the water uh when sampling next please okay let's uh look for case one it's the ideal board the board that we would like to have every single time that we are on field next so board condition casing is upright there is like no obstructions it's high to medium recharge it's the little baby that we have there to take care of. So method that I always start with is low flow, which we should be aiming to use in all them. Draw down that um, we would like to reach is 10 centimeters maximum, but we know that sometimes it's not practicable to use, to have these 10 centimeters only. Which equipment we can use, it's external peristalt pump, pneumatic pump could be baler or uh, double valve pump as well. So when you're going to sample, only when you you reach the level in parameter stabilization. It's good to have three readings within the required variation. Um, for example, pH, you have a determined var variation 0 0.05. So up or down, you have these three readings agreeing with that. Next one please. So we move it on the ideal board to the water level. You start is trying the low flow and the water level, it's not stabilizing at all. What do we do? Next, please. So uh, we know now that this board doesn't have a high recharge. It's a medium to low recharge. You can feel it when you are checking the water level and the recharge of the bore when purging, okay? So we, we change straight away to three times volume. So we know the drawdown is more than 10 centimeters. When also, when we, you can do it, okay? So you purge three times volume in two, three hours. Why I say this? Because time is money and sometimes um, a bore uh, to, to grab of three times volume, it's too much, like um, 70, 80, 90 liters, and you are going to take a lot of time. So always align with your client, the expectations and the limit you can reach, okay? The equipment that you can use for these could be any of them, but always thinking on the disturbance of the water as less as possible. Okay, you are going to sample after you have purged three times volume or and after the parameters stabilization. So in the last three liters, let's start to, to read 
or last five readings, just be aware of the, the water quality and see if it's stable or not. Usually it is, okay, like 99%. A tip for you is when you are starting a low flow and then you see that, that the drawdown is more than 10 centimeters or it's not, you, you cannot stabilize the water level, have on hand a constant for quick calculation or a reference table as the one that I have on the right there. Okay, just to, to be in mind how much water you will need to purge with three times volume if it's practical or not, and then it will help you to decide if you stick with three times volume or you try the third method. Okay, next please. In this um, case, case three, you said, okay, let's um, do three times volume, but the bore doesn't have three times volume in it. So it gets dry before. It also is, um, practicable for those balls that are really the column of water, it's too low. Next. So this we can um, say that is a medium to low recharge and three times volume could not be achieved. What do you do? Purge the ball until it's completely dry, okay? Uh, it can usually give, give it a limit up to two hours um, to do it because you have tried already low flow and then switch it to three times volume and then um, dry bore. So always think time and money. Okay, equipment, you can use any equipment. Just be aware that with some pumps where the water gets in, it's not at the bottom of the pump. So when you the pump cannot purge any more water, you could have some water left in the bore. Just use the bailer to grab everything out. Okay. When you're going to sample this bore that you have just dried, um, you wait until it is 9% recovery of the water level, okay? But with a maximum of three days after for you dry. Although, otherwise, you are going to have stagnant water again, okay? Even some balls you get there uh, three days after and you see like 25% recovery. That's okay. Uh, note and um, align with the client again and sample. Okay, it's important to sample. Next one, please. Case four when we have a band ball or it is obstructed. Next. Priority one is to collect the sample and finish the round because next three months you need to do all over again. So, but always align decisions with client, what they are happy for you to do, okay? If the ball is partially obstructed and you can reach the screen of the ball to purge this ball properly, you can use as uh, the photo that we have a peristaltic pump, which you drop just a tube in and it's easy and done. So the method will depend on the recharge as we, we discussed before. If it's totally obstructed and you are lucky to have the water level below it, okay, um, below this obstruction, and also depending on the recharge, you are going to use, um, sorry, there is, should be equipment and a method. Um, equipment, you can use any of them that will be suitable for this ball, but the method you need to uh, check on the recharge, okay? If you, for, for example, you dry the bore and then come back three days after and you don't have any water to sample. Just think about that. Okay, next, please, Kyle. So a few comments that I have seen in my life and I would like to bring to this webinar is sometimes you look at the records and they are readings less than half liter. Are we tricking the readings in parameter stabilization? Um, what I would say is you need to think about um, how, what is the recharge and the volume of the bore 
the volume of the water that is in that pore. Okay, so always calculate how much water that ball has. So you are not sampling, ensuring that you are not sampling stagnant water. You are sampling uh, fresh water from the aquifer and the sample represents the aquifer. Okay, next please, Kai. So I, I got an example for you. For example, this one, we could be sampling in the fifth reading because you can see that the parameters are getting stable uh, and I'm meeting after purging it's better to wait until you get six liters to have fresh water in so in in the end we have project 10 liters and gone stabilization as well next kyle please um another thing as i'm hydrogeologist as kyle mentioned um i like to look at the readings and understand what is going on uh, down there with the, the aquifer and etc so you having this in mind and with experience with time you will understand if it's time to sample or not. Here we have a ball that you can see pH oscillation and EC oscillation, conductivity oscillation. Um, this ball, when I, I was looking at it and the data and the data was, oh my God, what is this oscillation? Four and then three and then up to four again. And I said, no. No, that's enough. I have forged 20 liters. I think at this ball, if I'm not wrong, um, the volume was six or seven liters as well. So 20 liters, that's enough. Make the note that we, I could not reach the stabilization of these two parameters. And then I come back to the, the client and said, look, I couldn't get the stabilization on this. And I suspect something is happening there. And I got the, uh, the confirmation from the client say that there are different flow paths on the area. Okay, so just be aware communication with the client is the key. Next, please. Another interesting one is the O calibration. I have noted that uh, not everyone or even the majority does the O two point calibration. Okay, always the 100%, but doesn't use the zero solution to calibrate the zero. Okay, um, but what we need to think about is how is the geo um, readings on the site, how important it is for the program. If you have geo readings really, really low uh, on the site, it's really important to have two point calibration. Okay, so otherwise you are not get, getting it um, accurated enough. So it's a few things that I, I had experience and I have seen on my, my experience life, let's say, and uh, I have pointed here. So I think uh, this is the end of the presentation, but if you have any questions, please bring this in. And we'll be happy to answer. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. That's, yep, that was good. Um, yeah, I guess just a, a couple of, of points, I suppose, around the uh, equipment selection, uh, selection aspect. Um, of course, as we know, you know, the equipment that you're going to use for um, for your mine site monitoring is, of course, going to be, you know, site specific. So um, it's really going to depend uh, on the equipment, but also it's going to depend on what you can use given the uh, bore depths and locations that uh, you're dealing with, um, with those specific methodologies in mind. So, you know, um, we're always happy to help you and assist in that regard on, um, you know, what, uh, what sort of mine site and, and challenges you're dealing with uh, as opposed to bore depths and that sort of thing and sort of match up as best as we can around that sort of equipment selection uh, for, for the job. And uh, just building upon what uh, Michelle said also, just around the, uh, you know, the calibration perspectives. Um, 
with the DO being the example, you know, uh, having having single point DO calibrations in the in the you know the hundred percent saturation, um, we were seeing you know a strong correlation between a couple of sites that uh, at the DO readings that were coming out just from that one point calibration uh, were were higher than um, you know the same site and uh, our DO readings uh, getting those those two point calibrations happening with the zero percent. Um, so it's really important with your water quality meters and everything that you are uh, selecting ranges uh, that you would um, be likely to expect in that in those zones uh, in those sites, uh, especially with one uh, you know two point calibrations are always better than one point or three points are always better than two points. So as much coverage as you can get on the instrumentation itself, uh, whilst it does you know take a little bit more time uh, at the end of the day, we're looking for our, our accuracy of our readings. Um, and that's the most, you know, important part at the end of the day. Um, and also, you know, just be, uh, you know, be, be aware, uh, as Michelle said, around those uh, regulations in relation to your particular state and where you're doing that. See that there's quite a lot of fluctuation there uh, in, uh, in varying, um, you know, methods that, uh, that Victoria or Queensland like to use. Um, so just, you know, as again, just check that up and uh, make sure that you're, you're following those as best as possible. Um, so we'll just move to uh, if there's any questions available. Um, Chris J uh, asks, uh, what frequency would you purge bores that are sampled weekly uh, using the Baylor method to obtain samples? Uh, Michelle? Uh, yes, thank you for the wrap up. Um, Kayo? So if uh, there is a first thing um, no, for me, okay, my, my understanding is um, I use, I only use Bela if there is not a other method of viable. So just chat with us, Chris, if you can use any other method that you can stick with a low flow or even if you're sampling weekly, perhaps a dedicated um, pump will be recommended for you. Um, but the frequency, depending on the method, you can get on this ball, but um, no more than 0 0.3 um, liters per minute, I would recommend. Uh, more than this is not low flow, but if you can get 0 0.1, 0 0.2, it will be ideal. Okay. Yep. Um, Edward Rice, just, uh, uh, thanks, Chris, for that, for that question. Um, Edward Rice just said, uh, what are your thoughts on the use of hydro sleeves in, uh, in no flow sampling? Um, look, the, uh, the hydro sleeve um, way of things is something that's, uh, you know, come up uh, quite a lot uh, recently and is starting to build more traction through the use of hydro sleeves uh, in those sense. They do have their purpose uh, for sure. Um, I have been looking at, you know, uh, cross comparing, uh, you know, some data and sort of doing my, my sort of due diligence on that regard for the hydro sleeves. Um, but I guess at the end of the day, uh, you know, they're, they're a less expensive method um, and they, they get the job, they get the job done, uh, but it's really dependent on your, on your sort of data quality, I suppose, uh, when you take in factors of hydro sleeves for use of, you know, disturbance in the bore, depending on what method you're using to collect the sample. If you're doing a rapid pull up of the hydro sleeves versus, you know, the oscillation method to try and uh, trap, you know, the water that you're collecting in that hydro sleeve in a specific zone, um, you know, you will be still creating that sort of disturbance uh, and mixing depending on if you're take, putting your hydro sleeve down versus if you're, you know, potentially leaving it there dedicated, um, whether you're, you're doing your oscillation method, you might be, um, you know, using that disturbance method to get column water into that uh, zone of sampling uh, anyway. Um, so, you know, it's, it's sort of a more and more, it's being recognized as a, as a method uh, to use. Uh, my preferred is always gonna be uh, low flow, you know, when practicable, but I certainly see, um, you know, why people are selecting the hydro sleeves simply for, you know, the cost and, and the ease of use type thing. Um, but I would, you know, I would probably, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm 
very interested to look at um, data comparisons at same sites with hydrosleaves versus low flow method and see what sort of comes about with that. So um, if anybody here does have that, uh, has been doing a little bit of comparison themselves on that, I'd certainly be interested to hear that uh, as well. But yeah, um, the hydrosleaves are a thing that's moving up more and more uh, in this field. So uh, yeah, thanks for the question there, uh, Edward, on that. Um, thanks for the anonymous attendee. That's a uh, great presentation. Um, any equipment for remote monitoring? Uh, I'm guessing you might mean uh, something that's uh, going to be, uh, you know, telemetered or something like that. Um, if you can maybe, um, if you in that time, if you can maybe elaborate. But I'll talk about, I'll talk about that. Um, we certainly do have equipment for remote monitoring, uh, if that's the case. Uh, you know, sometimes the challenges associated with sites that are very remote um, can be, you know, not only from an equipment provision perspective, but also making sure that things uh, things work out there. So, um, in the, in the case of uh, you know instrumentation for you know level or uh, anything like that. Um, we do have, you know, telemetered systems that work for sort of satellite and we have worked with a lot of mine sites around Australia and those remote areas to come to, you know, uh, a solution uh, for them with, with satellite or, you know, uh, localised um, you know, LoRaWAN systems or um, some sites uh, getting their actual, their own sort of 3G, 4G towers uh, out there. Um, but certainly there are ways uh, to, to do that for remote sites and we have um, yeah, plenty of experience in that regard uh, for that. Um, yeah, the remote monitoring is always a tricky one, um, but from a, you know, a sampling kind of perspective um, as well, there is, you know, um, when the remote sites there, there can be quite uh, deep, deep bores and, and challenging bores. And so, you know, if you're looking at an actual equipment for, for sampling in remote monitoring, then maybe the, the use of a, a dedicated systems uh, to leave the pump uh, in situ there um, would be something you, you should consider uh, because it sort of reduces our, our field time out there um, for that and having the pumps already installed in those sort of challenging bores. Um, so hopefully that, that answers your question. Go Ryan, thanks for joining us. Um, are you aware of any guidance on sampling of aquitards? Oof. Um, I'm not too sure. Michelle, have you, are you aware of any guidance on that in that aspect? No, I don't know about Australia. I know that back in Brazil, we have many of them, uh, but around ball construction and sampling uh, method as you you mentioned previously um, the, when you want, would like to, to sample only a portion of the ball. But I can um, do a search and clarify this for you later, Ryan. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. That'd be, uh, yeah, that'd be great if you could, Michelle. Um, I'd certainly be interested in that as well. Um, oh, right, yep. So uh, does the, so just elaborating on that, um, question for the uh, remote monitoring, you know, to have to be, doesn't have to be checked manually in syncs to a cloud server, et cetera. Yeah, that's, that's right. We um, have worked with quite a few mine sites uh, around Oz where there's um, specificity in them, you know, needing to have their data and everything um, put forward to a particular uh, system. Um, you know, uh, one I can think of is like an Equus um, system where the data has to be, you know, uh, uptake by um, by their, your server. Uh, we can certainly, um, you know, push data uh, in various formats to to the mine's particular server. Um, but if that's not even if that's not a requirement, then uh, we can certainly host data through our our, our own cloud-based platform in a data stream. So uh, that's a it's pretty similar sort of you know login um, type. Uh, you know, cloud-based server where we, uh, you can view your data remotely uh, through there and check on 
you know, check on how things are going in sort of nice, pretty graphs. So there's certainly capability of hardware that can be, you know, installed remotely and, and, and being back to either your particular servers or hosted by us. So um, feel free to uh, contact me um, in the details there uh, if, if you need to uh, or wish to see anything else further on that. But thank you for the questions. Yeah, one thing that I think uh, it's important to add is about alarms, Kyle, for these. Yeah, this that's right. And server, that's yeah, that's server. right. So we can also, yeah, being the having not having to check manually. Thanks for that, Sean. Um, having not been able to have to check manually, there's also yeah the alarm sort of system that we can implement on our uh, on our servers. Uh, you know, when there's um, an example being uh, battery battery life or voltages, uh, we can sort of have exceeds or um, low levels, uh, which can trigger alarms in that sense on a particular unit. Um, so that's utilised uh, in quite a few uh, sites that we uh, we oversee. Um, so when we see low voltages in our batteries, that's sort of an indication where you might need to do um, a, a site visit if possible um, to check that so we uh you know quite proactive on that sense um to ensure that uh, no data is or minimal data is lost in that regard if if a unit goes down or, or something like that um just checking through all avenues here now if you have any other questions just please send them through otherwise we will be finishing. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, yep. Yeah, if there was, um, oh, hang on. Dan's got one for us here. Okay. Good session. Dan Evans just says, uh, thanks. Thanks, Dan, for that good session. Um, would be great to have a similar surface water monitoring presentation. Uh, it can be even more crucial to get sampling right, given that these systems are often more dynamic and variable on both a uh, spatial and temporal basis. Then ground, well, yeah, it's a good point then. Uh, we certainly, we certainly will take that on board and uh, provide that through um, to our uh, webinar series. We have, um, we have, uh, you know, quite a, quite a large, um, you know, there's getting some good traction here on these webinars, which is really great to see. And we're really uh, enjoying uh, doing these uh, presentations for everybody, uh, you know, in, in the field. Um, and so we'll take that on board for the surface water sampling. I totally agree. Yeah, it can be very crucial. And um, you know, uh, we'll certainly do the, uh, the surface water one, that's for sure. Uh, anonymous attendee said possible uh, presentation on willow stick groundwater mapping. Uh, we do actually have a uh, webinar that we've done uh, with willow stick in the past. Um, and so you'd be able to to find that uh, on our on our website uh, under the webinar section. We do record all these and um, sort of a few webinars back, uh, maybe uh, six or seven, uh, there was a willow stick. Uh, webinar session there. So feel free to go and watch that uh, recording on that one. And hopefully that helps. If you are struggling to find that one, please just uh, send me an email and I'll point you in the right direction. Okay. Um, so I think that covers uh, everything there uh, in regards to the questions. Thanks very much everybody for sending those, uh, those through. Um, so yeah, I hope you enjoyed today and thanks Michelle for joining me uh, on this one and um, hope you all uh, enjoy the rest of your days and, and thank you very much for, um, for joining us. We'll see you soon. Thank you so much, Kayo, Marcio and everyone that has attended and bring up questions.